Good morning. Welcome to this morning's assembly. Tom Hoops will introduce our speakers. All righty, friends. Let's find our seats, shall we? <clears throat> um, It is my great pleasure to welcome back to George School two old friends and fellow George School alumni, Hannah Gosnell Schneider and Nathan Pogue. Both of them are scientists who graduated from George School a long time ago and who have had extraordinary lives and careers since then. And they now both make their home in the great state of Oregon. This morning's reading comes to us from Henry David Thoreau from an essay called Walking published after his death in 1862. Good morning. Okay, Henry David Thoreau. I must walk toward Oregon and not toward Europe. And that way the nation is moving. And I may say that mankind progresses from east to west. We go eastward to realize history and study the works of art and literature, retracing the steps of the race. We go westward as into the future with the spirit of enterprise and adventure. Eastward, I go only by force, but westward, I go free. Are we live? Yes. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yes. All right. This is great. This is, this is really, really great to be back. Hannah and I have talked about doing something like this because I think both of us are in places that are perhaps a little removed for, both, for most of you. And I strongly suspect that when you think of scientists, for some of you folks, you may think white lab coats. Um, most of us, in what we're doing, don't wear that when we're working. So, we decided to call this interesting things to do with a science PhD in the wild, wild west. These are gonna be a little bit of a flashback, a little bit of an overview of where we came from, what we're doing, maybe set the context a little bit with how George School influenced us. We're really hoping for Q&A on this at the end. We really want to encourage discussions because we were both sitting where you are now, okay? So, where am I? Other side of, the, of North America, about the same latitude, very different spot. Whoop. Right over in here, I'm, I'm working currently in the Blue Mountains, which is primarily Oregon, but some Idaho. A Little bit of Washington is picked up in there. For about the last three and a half years, I've been working on the Malheur National Forest, kind of in green here, based out of John Day, Oregon. And I'm in the process of moving over to the Wallow Whitman, just next door, um, in Baker City. All right. So how did I get here? Um, 1884, my dad's mother's mother's father homesteaded north of Spokane. That half section, which is 320 acres, is still farmed by that same family, the Eichmeyers. Come forward, so I had, a, I had a, a western sense growing up or an awareness, really hadn't spent any time there. Um, an assembly that was featuring students who had worked with the Student Conservation Association. Anybody deal with that? Go on anything? Raise hands? Yes? No? Wow, the world has changed. I spent a summer in Mount Rainier. Absolutely fantastic. That put me in touch with my relatives out west. Um, ended up going to Dartmouth College. Uh, seemed to have majored in off-campus programs. After that, got interested in learning German for all things, um, got over. I was in Berlin when the wall fell. Interesting experience in and of itself. Um, from there, came back to the States, went to Oregon State University for the master's and PhD, focused on how old growth Douglas fir dominated forests developed, and particularly young trees. That caught the attention of some of the environmental groups that up to that point had been protesting active management and that began a very interesting, for me, a step to the right into some of more of the social scientists. I stepped 
through federal postdocs, both with the US Geologic Survey and Forest Service, bounced down, worked as a private consultant, ran one of these collaborative groups, which is a sort of emerging social experiment. We'll come back to that. Um, and then went to work for the Malheur about three and a half years ago. And have, as I said, have just switched over to the Willow Whitman. So what I'm doing right now, I help people count and measure things I mean, in, in, in some ways and solve problems. Three different, four different things that I'm involved in. One is we developed a very user-friendly or relatively user-friendly uh, way of accessing Landsat data. You could use it for George School if you wanted to look at land use change in the surrounding areas since say the 80s and forward. Somebody wants to do a senior thesis, your task is to find me and let's talk. Um, another one, basic forest inventory. The Malheur was about 1.7 million acres in size. Um, this is what allows us to take an 80,000 acre project area, develop estimates of what's across the entire project area, and then maybe manipulate it, or just simply grow it out in time in our modeled world to play out how we think if we do something or do nothing, that's going to play out. In this particular scenario, I was simulating the effects of an actual fire, a very big fire, um, and then what would happen if we did something post-fire or nothing and then ran it out for 50 years. Another thing, I do a lot with remote sensing, uh, both acquisition. LIDAR is something, you can think of it as later laser radar. This is going to only increase in time. This is a tool that we have to model individual forest stands, but also make predictions of things like uh, American Martin, which is kind of a, a weasel of sorts, um, and where that is. This is an extremely interesting technology. Again, this is something I'll be happy to talk about afterwards. But this is getting to the point where we can look at over really big areas, very, very fine details. It isn't just the overstory. This is also how most of the mapping for topography, for flooding, things like that is being done. Okay, so now we're going to switch a little bit into the sort of a disturbance ecology and climate change. Um, the climate change arena is a really, really big one. In your lifetimes, we may very well see the most number of human beings on the planet. And this is faced with a continually changing climate with the addition of human inputs that shift that. Exactly how much, we don't know. But I think it's safe to say that things are changing, they have changed, and they're going to continue to change, all right? This is an issue for your generation. Climate change is going to drive conflicts around the world. In some ways, it already is. Not just in North America, not just in the United States, but around the entire planet. So this is science that you guys are going to live and have to deal with. But it is science. There are uncertainties. We make the best predictions that we can, and we modify those if they don't maybe play out quite the way that we thought. That's the basis of science. Going from George School, roughly over here, huge star, over to Oregon, you see kind of the story of the West, the American West, at least. In that, see the green dropping out? This is an artificial coloring, you know, sort of in the background. Lots of vegetation, rains in the summer. You hit the West, even out on the coast. Uh, coast Redwoods down here, Sitka Spruce right along the coast. Even there, the story of the West, as you go further and further, is summer temperatures, not unlike here, but the huge difference is that the precipitation is concentrated in the winter months. So January, February, March, April, May, across to December, so you get the sort of year wrapped around. And look at this, it's high in those winter months at either end, and then tapers off. Right now, and these are using climate normals from 1950 to, to 2000, Averages, this is a, near, a place kind of in eastern Oregon near Hell's Canyon, uh, but the same general pattern is the same, and it's the same whether you're on the east side or the west side of the Cascade Mountains, which kind of run down right here, like Mount St. Helens, uh, Mount Hood, chain of volcanoes on that coast. Um, and right now we have this, most of our precipitation in the, on the drier side comes as a form of snow, and it slowly melts off, we get continued rains, and this long protracted phase. This is what drives the vegetation currently. We're going to come back to this. Yeah, it's a graph. Get used to it. These are the kind of things that policy decisions and people's lives depend on. Okay, so we'll come back. We're going to have some repetition here. Um, 
One of the things I, I really liked lacrosse when I was here, um, also cross country, played soccer for a little bit, but lacrosse was really the big one for me. Um, in college, I learned to ski. I'd never been on skis before. And that, uh, I swapped one stick for two and put them on my feet. Uh, this is something that I really, really enjoy. It was one of the reasons that I was excited to move over to Baker City. Um, great place, great powder. However, that same snowpack that I mentioned in the previous slide also sets up conditions for something that is very much part of these landscapes. And that is disturbances in the form of fire, and it's disturbances in the form of sometimes very large insect outbreaks, where if trees are stressed, or vegetation is stressed, but trees we'll focus on here, are stressed, they don't have enough extra photosynthate to produce defensive compounds, and you get a situation where insects can take off, the, and these are background insects. There's nothing you know, unusual or weird or bad about it. It's just part of the ecosystem. But you can get just like a really big storm, and you get storms on the East Coast, right? Hurricanes, things like that. But it's when you get a lot of them, or a big outbreak, or a big slug, that you can begin to knock a system out of its kind of normal or expected range of variability. So I arrive in the Malheur National Forest, June 2015. And this is what the view looks like in mid-August. The 110,000 acre Canyon Creek fire, I took these photos. Um, if you don't see a citation, you know, somebody quoted, the photos are from me. This is um, taken from the roof of my house, looking up at this enormous wall of smoke and flame coming toward us. Right? This was dumb luck. If the winds had not shifted and instead had blown embers down, the town would be gone. Half a mile away, three quarters of a mile is about where that, that smoke is. 13 miles away because of the wind shift, uh, live embers were dropping and starting grass fires, uh, but not here. So you're packed, you're ready to go. This is kind of a, a fact of life in these parts of the world. And for those of you that were paying attention to what was going on in California, this is not just the, the dry side of the Cascades or dry side of the Sierras. This is a fact of life in the West and it is very likely to continue on into the future with increasing frequency and increasing intensity. So, a uh, little bit of perspective. You all know, I think, uh, Smokey the Bear. Big shift has happened in Smokey. Uh, Forest Service got very, very good at suppressing fires, completely putting them out, smoke on the ground, we want it cold by about four in the afternoon, kind of thing. That has shifted to the point where, you know, it's maybe wildfires, these excessive events that we don't want. But what we are beginning to realize, just like tides at the coast, maybe moving through mangroves, that there are certain levels of disturbance that shape and are absolutely critical for maintaining the kinds of ecosystems that we do want. If you take a look at that top photo, this is north in, in Washington, but the picture, the, the story, the general story is about the same. Um, early panoramic view, from the 1930s. Notice how open this is. It's got stringers of forest. That is the result of a long period of time with frequent but relatively low intensity fires that might start down low and burn up and keep out. The effect of that is to lower the general crowdedness of those forests, making it a little more difficult for, say, a fire to start and then suddenly blow up. Smokey the Bear comes along and you end up with fire suppression that allows an awful lot of trees that aren't, say, something like Ponderosa, which is a little more resistant to fire, but something that, like Grand Fur, goes along and can erupt when you get that. We are reintroducing fire. I got certified as a wildland firefighter earlier this year. We are, in a controlled way, attempting to reduce some of those fuel loads and use fire as a tool. This is a fascinating change for an agency that has gone from absolutely no fire whatsoever to in a very thoughtful and calculated way with a great deal of humility and a certain amount of luck, we are bringing that back in as a tool, intentionally bringing fire back into these systems. Um, really quickly, got just about three slides left. Um, this is that same graph that I showed up on top, sort of the climate normals we're using 1950 to 2000. Running it out again, here's that big, long ramp down in spring precipitation. An average, this is sort of an average values of models. This is the thing you guys need to watch because this is going to drive conf conflict in your lifetimes. 2070, it's just a little more than 50 years out. 
Okay, not very long. The biggest change that is projected to happen in these types of forests is right in here in precip. And look at this ramp down. And think about what that's going to mean in terms of stressing things, in terms of lack of water, what that means in terms of resource conflicts. This right here is what the future of a good chunk of the planet, and certainly here, is likely, I want to qualify that likely, to look like. Okay? This is really sobering. This is where data tell huge stories. We pause and look at it. Okay? A couple things that I focus on but that are very likely or, or are already being impacted by a changing climate. A uh, couple different species. Aspen, where I am, is there aren't many hardwoods in the forests. This is one that is of value to a whole lot of people, from hunting groups to environmental groups. White bark pine. High elevation species, very likely to be listed under the Endangered Species Act, which has some great consequences. One of my little side gigs is to do tree climbing. Um, in this case, collect cones from trees that are resistant to an uh, introduced disease. And then finally, here we are in what some people call the high desert area, little strips of green around the streams. We have salmon that swim hundreds of miles upstream from the Pacific Ocean to come here to spawn. This was taken about two years ago in the spring after this one had overwintered and spawned out. And then finally, and this is going to be kind of a segue uh, into Hannah's side, I work with collaborative groups. And this is a place, and maybe we'll come back to this because I'm just about out of time, but this is a place that I think a lot of the things that I was exposed to, I could call them my George School roots, um, if you will, in terms of consensus, in terms of respect for a diversity of opinions, in terms of trying to get people and move beyond the stereotypes, avoid generalizations, to try to solve some problems. Many of these folks previously had only ever spoken to each other through lawyers in courtrooms or in some cases with threats of violence. Right? This is a place, this is a social experiment, this is a solution that in my opinion translates a lot of the things that are being put out here in a sort of an academic way where these can really and truly play out. It is not easy, but for the time being, it seems to be something worth pursuing. And so this will be my segue to Hannah. I'll leave you with this. Um, maybe this is a little bit of science. What you are looking at is a picture taken at about 10.30 in the morning, 10.30-11, of the eclipse that we had in 2017. John Day, where I was, um, was absolutely in ground zero of the track. This is the only picture I took of the eclipse. Panoramic view, sight, spin, and you can see the sun blocked by the moon right up there. Everything got still. We knew it was going to happen. It got still, it got cool, it got quiet, and it was absolutely incredible. So with that, Hannah. So great to hear about Nathan's work. It's funny, Nathan and I just happened to bump into each other at a USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station office a couple of years ago in Portland. And I just happened to be there for a meeting with one of my colleagues and he was working there. And I said, hey, didn't you go to George School? And yeah, I remember you. And we just, so our lives have kind of like crossed paths here and there in the Northwest in Oregon a few times and we thought it'd be fun to come back here. But I, had, I didn't know that much about exactly what Nathan did. So it's really neat to hear about that ecological side of things. I, we both look at issues related to climate change adaptation in Northeast Oregon, um, but I'm very much coming at it from a social scientist point of view. So I'm really interested in how people relate to the environment and how they relate to each other. And this is one of my favorite quotes by Aldo Leopold. So currently I'm a professor of geography at Oregon State University. But you may wonder, how did I get there from here? So I'm gonna start out with a, a little bit of a, more, my, story is a little bit more of a personal journey here, so bear with me here, but you know, what a punk, right? I, uh, I, because of some decisions, I, bad decisions I made in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade attending public school in the suburbs of New Jersey, I came to George School sophomore year as what they called a youth at risk. 
And I have to thank my parents for getting me out of a bad situation and thank George School for giving me a chance to change my future for the better and for really transforming me, or at least planting the seeds of transformation. Well, I had my share of FEIs and SMWDs and even a demerit while I was here. Thank you, Debbie D'Amico, for uh, <laughs> getting, getting, me, getting me back on the straight and narrow. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I did, over the course of three years, uh, eventually found my, found my footing. I was exposed to Quaker values, like the importance of humility and kindness and social justice and the idea of peace through consensus. And I did a service trip to Mexico, and I had the honor of being a peer counselor for SAGE, which I've heard some of you don't know that it actually stands for. <laughs> Students associated for? Greater, greater empathy. empathy, good. Tom didn't think you guys knew what, what SAGE stood for. Yeah, so anyway, that was, that was super cool to, be, to get to be on SAGE senior year, and I just learned, I mean, the SAGE training is so great. I learned so much, and just really was transformative. Um, and so my, I, I'd say that my, my senior quote here suggests that George School did somehow instill in me some sense of self-awareness and proclivity even for introspection. And I'm, I'm guessing it must have been all those hours in meeting for worship. So in the end, I went from being a bit of a delinquent to um, graduating from George School and doing okay. Although, um, although this picture here <laughs> Um, suggest something otherwise. Uh, I, I swear I did change. I, I did change while I was there. I just, I just wanted to throw this one up too because Rachel Finkel's there on the left. She was a good friend of mine and I think she has a, a daughter here now too. So um, pretty fun. Um, anyway, in spite of my somewhat checkered past, I uh, somehow got into Brown University. Thank you Dottie Kopic, college counselor extraordinaire. Apparently these college counselors can work miracles. So work with your counselors here. Um, but, but the highlight of, of my time at Brown, besides rowing crew, was actually when I left Providence uh, senior year to do a semester in the Rockies with the National Outdoor Leadership School. 90 days of backpacking, rock climbing, canyoneering, spelunking, that's caving, um, and backcountry skiing in Wyoming, Nevada, Idaho, and Utah. The experience was truly life-changing. I fell in love with the West and being in the outdoors, and I decided to pursue a career in outdoor and environmental education. So after college, I bought a truck with a loan from my parents, and I moved out to the wild, wild west to seek my fortune. Ha, in environmental education, I was making less than $20,000 a year for most years. Um, but I did, I got to live in Yosemite National Park for four years, teaching kids about nature and working for Outward Bound during the summers on public lands in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I met my husband there. Um, he's the one actually teaching the kids there uh, in the picture. And we got married in the Yosemite Chapel in Yosemite Valley. And, um, and while living and playing in Yosemite, I became interested in the conflicts over natural resources, not just what was at stake ecologically, but also how emotional people got about how land and water and wildlife should be managed, and how unfair and unreasonable and irrational so many decisions seem to be, the cultural and political aspects of how people relate to the environment. So in my free time, I wrote an article for the local Yosemite Association newsletter about the conflict between different groups of rock climbers over putting bolts in the granite walls. I interviewed people on both sides of the debate, equally passionate about their positions, and then tried to make sense of it all in this article and identify ways forward. And I found that I really enjoyed that kind of research and writing, and I decided I wanted to learn more about public land management. So I wanted to contribute to problem solving and, and help protect the Western landscapes that I came to love so much. So as an undergrad in the 80s at Brown, I truly never thought I'd go to graduate school. The grad students there were nerdy, pale people who hung out in the library surrounded by stacks of books. But now I saw it was an essential next step in being able to create positive change in the world. So I decided to pursue a master's degree and eventually a PhD in geography at University of Colorado in Boulder. And among other things, I studied conflicts over management of federal lands, which are, central, which are a central part of Western identity. As you can see on this map, about half of the West is public, and much of it is, is grazed. What I came to realize is that if you care about Western landscapes, you really need to understand ranchers and what drives their decision making. Because even though they are small in number, they control thousands of acres, much of it prime habitats supporting biodiversity. There are a lot of strong feelings about grazing on public lands. So some, some feel it is a right. You may have heard about the Bundys and the Malheur occupation, while others feel that it's a privilege and, should, and that the impact should be more strictly regulated. 
I also studied conflicts over allocation of scarce. Of, uh, al I also studied conflicts over allocation of scarce water resources. Uh, in many ways, water scarcity defines the West. As you can see on this map, the 100th meridian divides the country. To the West, average, an average annual rainfall is less than 10 inches a year, which means the irrigation is required in many places to make agricultural viable. Discussing um, uh, con conflict over water has always been commonplace in the West, but climate change is contributing to more frequent droughts, as Nathan was pointing out, which stresses streams and rivers and associated fisheries, triggering environmental laws and regulations like the Endangered Species Act, which severely limit how water is managed. So I got my PhD in 2000 and, um, and then did a, a postdoc at the Center of the American West at CU Boulder for several years. And then I got a tenure track professor job at Oregon State University about 12 years ago. So we were asked to talk about interesting things to do with a PhD in the wild, wild west. I'll say that being a professor at a major land grant university uh, out west uh, with, with a terrible football team, but a really great baseball team, is pretty cool. Um, my job's roughly half teaching, half research, and I advise grad students in geography, water resource policy and management, and environmental humanities. And I'm also part of the Sustainable Rural Communities Initiative. And I think what's fun about being a professor is that I get to ask questions that I think are important and then figure out how to answer them, working with smart, motivated graduate students and, and sharing what I've learned with my undergraduates in the four courses I teach there every year. When it comes to the research part of my job, most of my work's based on qualitative methods, including document analysis, interviews, and participant observation, which involves basically involves attending meetings and taking notes. I record my interviews, transcribe them, and then code and analyze them. And I, I analyze the transcripts looking for emergent themes. And when I write up the results, I use quotes as data. So a, a consistent theme in my career has been a fascination with the laws protecting what I think of as two of the most marginalized entities in the US West, Native Americans and endangered fish species. And a curiosity about why these laws, which are pretty powerful as written, haven't been implemented in, in ways that do justice to them. My curiosity about these issues, many of them having to do with social justice and fairness, led me to the concept of environmental governance. How do decisions about land and water use get made? How do conflicts get resolved through both formal and informal rules? How are winners and losers determined? And why are the tribes and endangered fish species always the losers? I found myself uh, inspired by, by stories of conflict resolution and collaborative conservation, that, like, Nathan, like, like Nathan was starting to talk about, and the idea of the radical center. The radical center, this place where people come together to share their common interests rather than argue their differences. The radical center is the middle ground between political extremes. So probably my biggest honor professionally was being the recipient of the Radical Center Researcher Award by the Covira Coalition in New Mexico a couple years ago for my work in this area. For the last decade or so, most of my research has focused on understanding the conditions under which groups of people find solutions in this so-called radical center through adaptive governance that promotes social ecological resilience, all in the context of a changing climate, which is exacerbating water scarcity in many places and making conflicts more common. I'll just give two quick examples of this kind of research, one in the Klamath Basin in South Central Oregon and, and Northern California, and one in the Blue Mountains in Northeast Oregon where Nathan works. So in the Klamath Basin, I wanted to understand how massive conflict involving farmers, ranchers, Klamath tribes, and endangered fish species over scarce water resources in a degraded ecosystem was transformed over a period of about 10 years into a collaborative, comprehensive agreement for social ecological restoration on a massive scale. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but the agreement that the formerly warring, that the formerly warring stakeholders came to in, in 2010 is going to result in, among other things, the largest dam removal in the history of the world. Four big dams coming down. Salmon is being brought back to the upper basin. It's, it's a big deal, and um, you would never have suspected that this could happen given how vitriolic the, the dialogue was down there just 10 years previous. Um, so um, my, my PhD student and I did, did over 100 interviews um, over the course of a few years to understand how peace on the river came about. And one of the most important findings that came out of the research was the critical role of apology and rectification and empathy in creating the space for finding creative solutions to sharing scarce uh, water resources. The Klamath case shows that you can't heal a river without healing the people first, namely acknowledging wrongs done to native peoples before you can move on. In one of the papers I published on this topic, I explicitly called for more attention to the role of empathy in the emergence of adaptive governance to promote social ecological resilience, probably thinking back to my days here at George School on SAGE. So, but one of the, um, 
one of the coolest things that happened in the Klamath Basin was when farmers who grow potatoes and ranchers who raise beef and the lower basin tribes who fish for salmon all came together after years of warring with each other and had a festival where they shared all their food with one another. So seeing these three kinds of food on one plate, a potato, a piece of salmon, and a steak, must have been really powerful for them. It was very symbolic. So, um, so switching gears to Northeast Oregon, a current project I'm working on in the Blue Mountains where Nathan works, I'm funded by the US Department of Agriculture Climate Hub to help ranchers adapt to climate change through the development of a decision support tool that gives them information about where to find good grass for the cattle in times of drought and a community-based observing network which engages local expert observers in monitoring environmental change to enhance their adaptive capacity. One of the coolest things about this project is the recent addition of a group of several Nez Perce people to, to our network. Um, let's see. So, um, Amelia and Doug and Veronica and Albert all traveled down to uh, meet with us from the Colville Reservation in North Central Washington. Um, the northeast corner uh, where Nathan and I work is now mostly private ranch land and U.S. Forest Service land, but the Chief Joseph, but for a long time before that, it all belonged to, in thousands of years I'm talking, it all belonged to the Nez Perce people. The Chief Joseph Band of Nez Perce were driven out by the U.S. Army in the 1880s, and Joseph's descendants are now a dispersed people, with many living on reservations in Washington and Idaho, far away from their homeland. We invited them to participate in our sea bond because we knew of their interest in coming back to the Wallowa Valley and harvesting and monitoring first foods important to the tribes, like camas bulbs, bitter root, and Indian potato. Um, and because the ranchers we're working with there are particularly interested in learning about indigenous pastoralist approaches to grazing livestock and managing land to enhance adaptive capacity, these ranchers are pretty unique and interesting and high capacity. They've had lots of exchanges with pastoralists from Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, Tibet, and Kenya, and they're trying to bring a lot of those ideas back to the U.S. West. So um, it's been really cool to see how, how, how maps can be boundary objects that bring different kinds of people together. Um, you can see here Nez Perce, uh, Nez Perce people and ranchers and researchers and U.S. Forest Service people all gathering around maps that my current PhD student Kyle made. Kyle's doing the geospatial analysis and mapping and developing a decision support tool for the group, a type of participatory GIS, while I do the qualitative social science to understand whether and how the decision support tool on the CBON is effective in helping with, with climate change adaptation. Oh, so yeah, this is a cool, what, what, what's exciting um, is that in, about this project, it has the potential to help Nez Perce people reconnect with their homeland through collaborative mapping with ranchers and university researchers. Our long-term goal is to launch a community-based coordinated innovation network for integrating ranching, rangeland, and first foods monitoring efforts. But not all current residents want to see the Nez Perce come back to allow it, so it is tricky terrain to be inviting them back and, 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 welcome, and trying to welcome them there. Uh, in a workshop we had last summer, a, a warm welcome to the Nez Perce elders visiting from Washington from this fourth generation rancher, Scott McLaren, um, sitting here at lunch talking to Veronica, um, was really powerful. Um, he now lives on what was once Nez Perce land, and he welcomed her back and said, I'd love to show you around and show you where your, tra your, your people's trails are and, and your, your watering spots. And, and, um, and she really appreciated that, and she really was excited to go back to those lands that she hadn't been to, really. I mean, maybe even ever, because she grew up on the reservation in Colville in Washington. Um, so, um, I, I, so I think... Um, he told her that uh, he'd, happy to, he'd be happy to show her around, and, and perhaps as a form of reciprocation, um, after that first day of the workshop, Albert and Veronica went out and harvested some first foods in the area, and they asked if they could start the second day of the workshop with a ceremony and sharing of foods with our group. For them, food is part of their religion, so it was a real privilege to be able to participate in that. So to conclude, I feel pretty lucky to have a career that allows me to help rural communities protect the landscapes I love, while also promoting peace and understanding through geographic exploration, and when possible, doing research that has policy implications for making the world better and more just. I credit George School with planting the seeds that grew into commitment, that grew into a commitment to environmental stewardship, along with an understanding of the relevance of kindness, compassion, and empathy for promoting peace and resolving conflicts of all kinds. I think it's worth noting that a lot of the problems I investigate came about because of a lack of empathy. And as I'm sure many of you have noticed, empathy is something severely lacking in political discourse these days. 
So it's great to see the latest crop of students being indoctrinated with Quaker values, because now, more than ever, we need smart, creative, and compassionate people who can address some of the big problems that we have ahead of us. And I hear there's a new social justice club here at George School that you all should think about joining. So with that, thank you. We have a few minutes for some questions. Way in the back. Yes, you, with a hand. Well, um, I, I have to I, my job, this is a typical job being a professor, I get paid nine months salary and then I have to raise the other three months every year. And so I'm always having to write grant proposals to get myself a month of summer salary here and a month of summer salary there. So that's why I always have like three or four projects going on because I just have to get little pieces of money to piece them together. And so you look for requests for proposals that come out periodically from the National Science Foundation, and the USDA and National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So most of my grants come from USDA, NIFA, uh, the Climate Hub, USDA Climate Science Center, sometimes NSF, National Science Foundation is really hard. Uh, like I have a 3% success rate. But uh, right now, I'm, I've got a proposal going in at the end of this month for, um, for it's a million dollar proposal and it will, it's to, it's to get the CBON up and running and really get some really good computer science people that are gonna create a data fusion portal so that the observations that our ranchers and, 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 and uh, tribal members make can be integrated with data that's uh, remotely sensed from satellite data, model data. So that's pretty cool. I have a small piece in that, but that's the sort of, there's always like uh, putting in proposals and often not getting them, so. Yeah, I'd echo that. I'm in a slightly different category, but still on the federal side and when I was a private consultant, you know, you're still going after external funding. So when I hit the mail here, for instance, it wasn't part of my job description, but I probably pulled in $100,000 a year in external funding. Some of it went for data acquisition. Some of it was for inventory. Uh, more broadly, one of the collaborative groups that I work with on the Malheur, uh, and this was spearheaded by an environmental attorney who had made her previous career, and she still does this occasionally, uh, is suing the feds under things like the Endangered Species Act, but was looking for something that would essentially accelerate timber harvest for the purposes of restoration. So remove trees so that you get fire back in these systems where it's been kept out. And that has been, this is one of the uh, CFLRPs or Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Project. This is millions of dollars. And that's cooperating with initially some very, you know, cynical uh, timber folks until it was pointed out to them that, you know, actually if you go along with this and start listening to the science about climate change, you're gonna be able to cut more trees. So one of the things about how you get grants is figure out not just where is the money coming from, but how to express what you're trying to do in terms that are receptive to people, but be honest about it, no BS. Let me throw in one more thing uh, on that exact point. And this is, this is something to the, to the English teachers and the people that help you write, okay? Part of the way you get successful grants is to write them well. And that is absolutely something that I can attribute to being at George School. Nancy Cox, John Gleason, and, and others. This is worth tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. The ability to communicate ideas. So just because I'm in science, predominantly, what came out of that side, out of the language side, is, has contributed enormously to, if you want to call it my success, uh, not to be underestimated. One more quick question. One over there, wait, 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 without the beard in the back. <laughs> yes, you. Uh, maybe. I, I have heard of that. I don't think that in terms of a legal sense that that has really gained traction. However, standing in the courts, like the ability to move a case forward, might be viewed in that. Hannah, you probably... It's, I think it's a very interesting idea. One more? One more? Are we done? Okay. 
I just want to I just want to echo that what, what Tom said. I want to say that the best thing I got out of George School was learning how to write, and um, the teachers here were just amazing. I want to say that uh, you know you know how when you're like trying to log on to something and you forget your password and it starts asking you all these questions like what was the name of your first dog, what's your favorite color, what's your favorite ice cream. And you know, you always have to pick questions that are like, oh, you'll always remember it because you always answer the same thing. One of them is, who is your favorite teacher? And I always write Terry Culleton. Oh. And, and I, I have been in, I have had so many teachers. I mean, as a PhD student, I've had 12 years of high school, four years of college, seven years of after that. So out of 23 years of teachers, Terry's my favorite. The best. I learned so much from him, and so yeah, I credit I credit a lot. I think Nathan's right that being able to write well gets you so far in life, even when you can fake it if you can write well. And so learning how to write well is an important skill. So, yeah. Let's have another round of applause for our speakers and for Tom. Thank you.